means and a very unusual thing. So if we win them out, if we win them in an ice cream, you know, I, we, we believe that it will give people more curiosity. You know, if it can taste good in ice cream, that you see which should probably taste pretty good on your fish as well, right? So <coughs> Yeah, I mean this is a way to illustrate that I mean this ice cream is somehow reminiscent of green tea with these very light uh, floral tones in it. And it's a great entry point for showing people the possibilities. If you take this seaweed that's, uh, I mean, people have the concept, the concept of seaweed that is this sort of rotting refuse that you sort of avoid stepping off the beach, um, which is actually usually just the, that unpleasant taste is just the dimethyl sulfide as it sort of decomposes. But getting, if you can think of um, an, an apple orchard, for instance, and you were walking through an apple orchard and all you looked at were the rotting apples on the ground, you would think uh, apples were really disgusting, whereas if you pick one off the tree, it's just a beautiful lush thing. In the same way that we like to show, use this to show people that seaweed, if it's processed well, can have very beautiful, delicate flavors. Um, <coughs> this one we found, uh, the aging process is extremely important in how we process it. This one, we keep it a very specific uh, humidity, and after a year, you can actually see the glutamic salts sort of rising to the surface. And that was a way that we use this seaweed to really um, punch out and get these intense, intense flavors from. Uh, we actually, uh, Mark, our anthropologist, who sort of does a lot of things, just built a, an ice cream bike. And he's actually going to bicycle around Copenhagen, uh, <laughs> handing out this for free as a way to, for us to get a, sort of a message to the streets and all that. So there you go, that's where your t intuition will end up in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, this is an up close and personal picture of uh, something that we're very proud of and that I think has extreme possibilities. We're working with fermented uh, fermented barley as a, basically as a way of using this natural amylase and proteases that it produces to process other foods um, in a very successful fashion, yellow peas, that was great for us to take a very traditional um, food stuff, process it with this fermented uh, barley, and then give it a new identity. It's, it's getting made of uh, yellow peas, it's like very traditional, like grandparents' soup, it's sort of like a ham bone. It's like comfort food you have on the weekends. Um, <coughs> so we're able to take that very traditional um, product, and we actually chose that specifically because we did a, a, an analysis of what we had available, and we found that it actually was very high in glutamic acids, um, and used this uh, barley to break down those acids into free glutamic acids to this intense umami flavor. Um, but we were working with it for about five, six months, and realized <coughs> that we'd actually never tried to just process it as it were it, something in itself, like a piece of meat. We never cooked it, seared it in a pan. And uh, it was kind of like one of those just eureka moments. So we just seared it up. And it was the in <coughs> fermenting, the starches are broken down into far more simple sugars. So they caramelizes beautifully in the pan. Just a touch of oil, and you get these lush brown, golden sort of hues in it. And when you break it open, there's this like unbelievable floral smell. And then unbelievably, there's this Iberico like, ham, uh, this fattiness, the taste of Iberico ham is um, really interesting. Um, so we were just, this is a, a way that we, just a product that we're very, very happy with. Yeah, and, but you know, you should also mention that the reason why we didn't think of it is because you basically have a cake of barley <laughs> that is completely, completely green of mold. You know? <laughs> you know when you see bread and they have these spots on there? The barley, it's not the same mold of course, but it's, it's like that, completely covered in mold. So, I mean, I, I think we're a few decades from, from the general public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Accepting I think, uh, such things in, in, in their home. It's a, it's a, you quite, I guess I've been sort of snacking it in the morning uh, <laughs> <laughs> during those five months, but it's, it's quite, but I think that's also another interesting thing to, to point out is that the, your acceptance of foods changes quite quickly uh, and marks uh, insect projects who had who took us maybe a week, six days for me, for uh, of every day of looking at a mealworm, slimy fat little worm, <laughs> looking at it with 
complete disgust, ready to vomit as soon as it was <laughs> near my mouth, to looking at it like a piece of parsley, basically, six days, just eating it every day. And then suddenly, I, you know, you start to taste it. Uh, another thing to mention about this is that this project, because of the uh, success we had with it, we're actually working with a team of microbiologists from Copenhagen University about finding new molds or combinations of molds and yeasts that produces, produce amylase. The idea is to have a new sort of toolbox of enzymatic uh, thing, products that you can use to affect uh, other products. I mean, taking and being able to convert uh, you know, anything, I mean, we've converted barleys, <coughs> peas, mushrooms, uh, garlic, garlic, vegetables, vegetables, <laughs> vegetables. with this, and we just, we brought over 30 uh, microbiologists, and it was great showing them kind of some of the more unusual things we're doing. Also getting a sign up of clean bill of health, actually. We joked about the bill, the boat being a sinking ship, but we were actually doing okay, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, but to have, to be able to affect food uh, with mi microbes and use microbes as a cooking tool is something that we're really excited about. It also gives you a sense of terroir because you're going to have microbes that are particular to a certain region. And that's what Rene was sort of talking about with uh, ethnomicrobiology is having like a region and the flavors associated with the region vis-a-vis -vis the microbiology. So that's, yeah? How did you select the microbes that you did? Because there's such a variety that could uh, uh, produce amylase and things like that. Yeah, well, I mean, also, I mean, if you malt barley, you produce uh, amylase as well. So um, we're looking for more of the sort of tertiary metabolic pathways, which are creating like the real flavor compounds. Uh, in this case, we started out with asparagus orzai, which is a very easy um, and that has these sort of floral tones in it. But we're looking for more endemic molds and yeast that produce uh, sort of similar combination. But it's particularly the tertiary <coughs> metabolic pathways that we're most fascinated by. The delicious in this one. Um, this is another fermentation project we've been working on. Uh, this is a kombucha mother. It's a, it's actually, it has a, Great American acronym SCOBE, which stands for Symbiotic Construct of uh, Bacteria and Yeast. And um, it's basically very, it works relatively similar to uh, a regular vinegar mother, except it's, it's constantly, it immediately goes from uh, sugar to alcohol to vinegar, um, single stepping. And we're able to do a lot of different uh, products with this, but most successfully was vegetable juices. Uh, we found the carrots that we get, in, particularly in the winter, uh, are very, very sweet and had enough sugar where we could actually just put this little sweetheart into it and uh, get a very interesting vinegar for it. And is that just like a gel matrix of the cell? Yeah, it forms like a mat, basically. And actually, you can see the ridges. The ridges here are actually uh, sort of lifelines, like in a tree. So this, is, this one's actually quite old. We we'll put it through the paces. Um, this is sort of a barley and yellow peas uh, that we were working on. Uh, and this is the house, you know, the houseboat. It's one of the, uh, it's picturesque, but it can be extremely annoying when you're using a micro scale. <laughs> so, I mean, we're looking for uh, new, new facilities because uh, it was very, very romantic in the beginning, but the uh, honeymoon's kind of over. <laughs> Um, this is a, a project when, when <coughs> we were working on when we're looking for new flavors and we sort of we're just trying to process very very ordinary vegetables in I guess sort of novel ways. Um, it's a drying of vegetables doesn't sound particularly novel, but we found that if we do it in very very particular fashion, we get an amazing result. You can see this uh, cucumber is actually caramelized in the seeds here. At, and this has just been dried at 60 degrees. At 55 degrees, it doesn't really dry, it just turns into like a leather. And at 65 degrees, it actually, there's a bitterness, like you've actually burnt it somehow, um, which is fascinating for us. But we ground into a powder. It's this lovely, rich, uh, 
Mediterranean almost tasting spice. These notes of like almost a Roselle type um, And this is fascinating for us because we don't consider Denmark to be like a spicy nation. So finding these uh, sort of like lox flavors in a very traditional kind of boring cucumber is amazing for us. I'll tell you, uh, I mean, one example of what actually came out of this, which I think is important to mention, is that we actually did, ended up doing a sauce uh, at the restaurant where we took this spice and we powdered it uh, a lot, so it was super, you know, fluffy. And, fluffy. and it really doesn't taste like cucumber. It's it's some it's a spice. It tastes like a spice. And then uh, we took whole cucumbers and we grilled them. And then we sealed them in a bag, and then they kind of steamed. And then um, we squeezed it, and then all the liquid that went up, that came out of that, we whisked back into the into this powder, so that it, it shaped, you know, created this sort of very potent, extremely rich and flavorsome sauce, just made with cucumber, uh, dried cucumber and grilled cucumber, totally vegetarian, super light to eat, and you know we served it with a caramelized piece of sweet breads. You know, it's a raw, a raw seps, sep mushrooms on top, and this super potent, spicy uh, uh, cucumber broth thing. So. And then, uh, this is <laughs> <laughs> um, this is part of uh, my <coughs> my work on the Mark's uh, insect project, and uh, we're we're looking at different ways of. Uh, <laughs> consuming insects <laughs> and grasshoppers, and like we were talking about before, it took, you about, it took us about a week to get really comfortable just crunching them down. Um, <coughs> like live grasshoppers, I was still eating them live is a little rough, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, ways of crossing it where we can get them really delicious. And one of the quite successful things we did was actually making a garum like we did with the mackerel sauce. Um, where we just basically blended it up, uh, we added a little bit of a fermented grains, and ten weeks later we had, uh, we actually just tried it two days ago. Yeah. yeah. And um, it tasted like the best mole sauce I've ever had, which is extremely strange, like very rich, chocolatey, velvety, yeah, malty, just unbelievable. We served it to people and they were like, Blown away and said, What was this? And, uh, <laughs> 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 um, but you know, it, it's for us to find a delicious way that we can show people that there's a great possibility in these novel foods. Um, and actually, show them that Westerners are really in the minority of the world population and not consuming insects. Um, something that we're very proud of. Um, <coughs> and then, um, it's, I mean, we're also trying to get chefs in and show them the possibilities too. It's amazing. Um, not, we tend to try and really push our message out to chefs and uh, hopefully curious scientists as well. Um, because we find that convincing chefs as what you call lead users is very important because when we're talking about food, it's always great to have people actually tasting the food. And so if we can get uh, just by using or implementing some of our ideas that every guest that comes into the restaurant becomes uh, another seed that can pass on the information. Um. Yeah. I think we should we should we mention, although I don't know if you know we should probably mention that we had actually brought samples of all the things that we have here. But uh, we don't have our luggage. <laughs> they, they, they took away our luggage, so uh, they are supposed to land on all the samples. You know, you could have had grasshopper and uh, everything, uh, and hopefully it will be there uh, later on. Uh, it will arrive in, in LA airport here, uh, well, four-ish, we think. Yeah. So. Then maybe for breakfast or next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to get the opportunity for um, John and Vinny. I know you guys have some stuff to set up. If you want to, feel free to keep talking and take yeah. some questions, and if there's yeah. more you want to. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, you're set up. Yeah. <coughs> we, um, you know, we, um, you know, th there's so many things going on in this, in this, in the North Food Lab. 
this is a fraction of it, and if we ever come back, we can really focus in on, and you know, spend some time on, on perhaps the government or, you know, uh, how. Uh, by, by the way, we we've just found ants that taste exactly like lemongrass uh, from the west of Denmark. So that we think could be a very interesting experiment uh, as well. <laughs> um, but there's so many things happening, and and, uh, and you know, I mean. We have we 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 are here also because we also want to meet you guys, uh, students, and uh, we've learned actually quite a lot from students at the Nordic Food Lab. We have also student programs. We've had two people from the University of Bra uh, with us, and we're going to have a, a student from Yale at, from the uh, Agrarian Studies, where we've also uh, did some lectures. It's going to be with us a year there, and and it's just you know we're. We're students of, of what we do. You know, we're kind of we don't know anything yet. We're still learning, and uh, and it's amazing what we've done with all these young people there uh, together. Uh, so, so please, anything, anything you want to ask us, anything, just, just go right ahead. <laughs> yes. Do you know what's like safe to eat and what's not safe to eat? Because like insects can produce toxic compounds that may. Yeah, well, we work, that's why we work with science as well, and we have, um, you know, we have a, a, a we have a, a contact, or even more so. Yeah. I mean, we, we are connected to the KBL, which how would you translate that in English? What the KBL? Is? The veterinary. School. Yeah. It's a study of a health nutrition school, a health nutrition. So, particularly with the fermentation things, we're quite diligent about getting it. Um, I mean, we're not interested in dying, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, one of the surprising things about this fermentation process is that it's actually quite easy to tell when it's going to die. I mean, the, the one sort of dangerous microtoxins, and that's what we have tested for. But besides that, during the fermentation processes, when it goes wrong, it, it really goes wrong. <laughs> um, You're not in doubt. How frequently does discoveries in the food lab translate into restaurant concerns? Restaurant food? So, um, not that often, and uh, which is very all right. But uh, this uh, fermented, uh, uh, the green peas that we dried and then fermented them to create this sort of very rich umami, rich paste, that is, that is looking to go into production, for instance. So that uh, other restaurants will actually use it and potentially even be in specialty sh uh, or maybe even supermarket shows. And um, so, if we can do that once every year, one or two times, we will create a, a mega success. If we are able to to find one or two of these, you know, pillars that can be used in so many ways, you know, a spoonful of that in your asparagus soup. Boom. Stir it in your your steamed rice. Uh, put it over your baked fish. You know the, these sort of uh, pillars that we're trying that we're looking for can, has are so versatile in, in the cooking aspect that um, that we're not looking to find. Uh, you know, uh, well, we, of course we would <laughs> if we were clever enough, uh, but unfortunately uh, we're not we we're not there yet. Um, so right now, we in, in particular, we have uh, the dried peas, the paste of that, which has proved to be a mega success. That is you know, full operation at the restaurant and at other places. The idea of the kombucha as a, as a, not as a health drink, which is typically is, uh, but as a, as, a, as a way of uh, changing flavors, you know, and another tool, another kind of tool in the box. To, to have more deliciousness and more complexity. That has been adapted by many restaurants, and there's even restaurants that actually uh, serve these drinks, uh, or these kombuchas as, as on the juice menu. So they would only keep, they would only ferment it for two days, for instance, instead of six days. Yeah. We, we went six days, right? Yeah. We went six days because that, that's when you know, the carrot was, still carrot, but totally acidic and wonderful, and it ref we use it to refresh Sources with vegetable sources, and you know, it was really magical. And uh, and then, I mean, we can see that there's thousands of people that tap into the website, uh, whether they want to read about curing a piece of meat or 
uh, you know, uh, vinegar things that we're doing. Um, it's it's slowly spreading, slowly, slowly. It is some. It's just it's kind of a yeah. uh, you know the, the idea of sh sharing the knowledge is kind of difficult, basically. Yeah, I mean that's one of the uh, largest challenges is actually disseminating our research and applying new things. Um, so that's one of the reasons we try and get, as I said before, a lot of chefs in um, this meal of our friends to uh, start putting this stuff on the menus because that shows a lot of people. But also just you know coming and doing lectures and talking to you guys and um, just trying to get our idea out there as much as possible. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, you were talking about ethnomicrobiology. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So have you guys like discovered kind of new interesting microbes and do you do the tests on them or grow them in your own lab or you kind of outsource that? Well, uh, I mean, work? typically we, we, uh, we outsource that because a lot of the, uh, like, if this, like initially I was looking for native uh, variations on asparagus and aspergillus and that's there's quite a few versions of them which are extremely toxic. Um, but we're looking, and that's actually normally found on the stems of uh, rice plants. So we're looking at other grains and seeing whether we can use the native molten on other grains. But for that, we typically outsource it because we are following safety. Yeah. Um, but also, just, um, I mean, the ethnomicrobiology is very, is a, sort of a study that's in its infancy and whether they're calling it microbial, ethnobiology, or no microbial so far oh. and But um, it's just new we're getting, we've just started getting into and getting really enthusiastic around Yeah, we basically in the past year and a half have realized this potential there is and, and how little is written on it and, you know, and how big it is. And the idea of using it as a tool, like as, a, as you would like a knife or an oven, Using these microbes to manipulate your food is like when you take a kombucha and you're like, oh, like run, run that juice through the kombucha and then you get. Or using like our fermented barley, we we'll actually going to get back to Copenhagen and we're going to work with milk products and seeing if we can use the enzymes to coagulate milks and process them. So there's a, a lot of interesting applications. If you consider, if you do like the sort of mental leap and you consider it as like a tool, like you would at any other kitchen tool. Yeah, we're running out of time, so it's three o'clock. Can I ask a Sorry, has there been any interest in like the South American food lab and all this kind of stuff from your part or anyone else? South American food lab? Like you said, you mentioned uh, like I mean, you wanted to start out as ah, South American Ah, no, food okay. Lab. Well, we're not, we're not sort of setting up food labs. Okay. But um, I was, the concept is more that you could take the way that right. we work with food. Right. Um, we are in contact with a lot of other restaurants um, around the world who were doing sort of similar things and we bounce ideas off each other all the time. In fact, when I did the, the fermented barley cake, I got four emails immediately as soon as I posted it, like, fuck oh, you, how come we never thought of that? <laughs> 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 so, so. Yeah. We should have not. Yeah, we'll move on. We have, we're in for such a treat today. We have this superb back-to-back -back, um, lineup. But let's thank Renee and Lars once again. Yeah, and then to the left. Cool. Anybody have a